All right, in part two of this video, I'm going to pull apart the movement of the watch. Um, I was in a bit of an awkward situation when doing this with uh, challenging lighting conditions, so you're going to see the watch move around a little bit. And the first part that I'm taking off there is just the calendar plate. So with this watch, they only have a date. And you'll see there I'm just taking off those small screws. Now I've already taken off the dial and hands, which I didn't do on camera because it's quite fiddly and because of the good condition of the dial I didn't want to risk damaging it. So I've uh, yeah, already had that one off. So we've just taken one side of the calendar plate off there. And you can see the click for the date ring. Now you see the click there is a shepherd's crook spring and uh, just a little uh, just one of those little, uh, I don't know the specific name of them, but um, just that little lever there. And to take the shepherd's crook spring off, I'm just using Rodico and the tweezers. That stops from, from uh, shooting off into the wilderness. And the lever just comes off there. Just bear in mind I'm doing this on an angle, so it's a little bit difficult to do. And then the next calendar plate comes off. And I'm just trying to be careful not to have a, a screwdriver slip and damage something. As you can see that I'm just having some trouble just trying to <clears throat> get the screwdriver into the into the screw. Now what I do to reduce the amount of scratches that I get, um, I don't really get any anymore, um, is I polish the tip of the screwdriver head and uh, that makes it really difficult to scratch something even if you slip. So if you've got a sharp edge there, it basically just cuts right in. However, if the uh, edges are polished, it makes it quite difficult to scratch at all. And I'm just taking off the other screw there very carefully. Yeah, so the 45 movement is quite interesting. It's a little bit of an oddball. Um, this a der or derivation of this movement was also used in the Astronomical Observatory chronometer. So the main difference between this movement and that one is that movement was, I think from memory, the 4520. And uh, the 4520 is uh, adjusted in multiple positions and also adjusted and compensated for in temperature as well. And we're just having a look at the change or the, um, the date wheel there. So you'll see it uses a cam system to flip the date around. So if you um, get that right when you're setting it up, basically what it will do is pressure will build up on a little spring that we'll see in a sec, which is loaded by the cam, which is on the top of the wheel. And then when it gets to midnight, the, uh, the little lever there will flick um, from the spring pressure and it will turn the uh, calendar wheel around. These are very fiddly when putting back together and there's several screws involved as well. So I'm just checking there just to see um, how much movement is there and whether I can uh, just take it off. And just trying to work out uh, what's the best strategy to get this off and I've just taken it just to the side because I couldn't really get the screwdriver to do what I wanted it to do and I just needed to take it to the side uh, off camera so I could get a get the right angle on there. So as, as I was saying the main difference between the uh, chronometer grade movement and this one is the balance wheel. So um, someone in Seiko, they uh, balance or well, they did further uh, tuning on the wheel, um, on the balance wheel. So someone would have sat there and uh, taken a bit more material off the wheel to um, compensate it in 
multiple positions and uh, then also uh, check the timing over um, over a temperature range and adjusted for that as well so on this one it's uh, unadjusted so they haven't done that and obviously adjusted movements are more expensive because someone ha actually has to manually do it and manually make changes to the balance wheel so if we have a look at the little spring there that's a bit of an oddball spring that's used as part of the uh, the date changeover system I'd be very careful not to lose that because I'm sure they're very hard to get and uh, you'll see it there when I get it into focus <clears throat> so that's the that's one part of it and if we come back you can see it's got a shepherd's crook, crook spring uh, which puts tension on the lever there which works with the cam system so I'm just removing that again with Rodico so it doesn't fly off into the wilderness. And then I'm removing the lever. And then the uh, the date wheel there. So you'll see the uh, little uh, cam comes off there. And it's locked into the date wheel in that... Uh, slot now I'm just removing the intermediate wheel now I could not get a good grip on this so you'll probably see me faffing around with it And there we go, that's that intermediate wheel coming out. So a few of the other SACO movements also had a uh, uh, instant, instant date changeover. The uh, 52 series of the King Seikos had it. Not sure what else though. The 52 series uses a very similar system, so it's a cam system and it builds up pressure, um, which then flicks over. So now we're just moving over onto the uh, keyless works, and I'm just removing the cover plate for the um, setting wheel there. got a fairly conventional keyless works you can see there as well um, despite being a reasonably high jeweled watch they've only put in uh, um, shock protection on the escape wheel and also the balance wheel which uh, is pretty standard I guess it's probably all it really needs So the escape wheel uses a die fix setting and the balance wheel uses a die shock setting. So the die fix settings, a lot of people when removing them have a lot of trouble with them but um, the, the easy way to remove them is to get an old oiler, a fairly thin one, and um, get that in between the framework and uh, see where the stick part of the wire comes out of the uh, die fix setting you'd put the oiler in between uh, that and the framework and then twist it slightly which just pulls the leg out the whole idea with the die fix um, setting was that it doesn't need the spring doesn't need to be entirely removed so you unset the spring take out the cap jewel and then reset the spring again before putting it into the cleaning machine um, I've been doing that for a long time and uh, I'm yet to lose one since I started doing that. Uh, in fact, um, the reason they call it die fix is it's fixed, it's not supposed to be removed. 
You can re uh, replace those springs if you need to, but they're a bit of a hassle. So there I'm just, uh, what am I taking off there? Um, the preview of this video is actually quite small, so it's just a little bit tricky to see what I'm doing. I'll just make it a little bit bigger so I can see what I'm saying. Okay, so you'll see there on the keyless works it has a um, it has a uh, setting lever with um, a little uh, star star wheel there to change the date. So there's nothing too exciting there. And again, I just had to take this to the side because it was a little bit uh, fiddly. I'm not going to remove the shock protection springs on camera because it's just too hard. That's an easy way to, to lose the springs and whatnot in there, in there. So you'll see the, the tension is put on the uh, setting lever by a shepherd's crook spring. Um, beyond that it's a pretty conventional keyless works. You'll see the bottom of the barrel there as well. So it's quite cut out and they would have um, they would have had that sort of arrangement just to uh, reduce the height of the movement. And again I'm just being careful there not to lose the shepherd's crook spring they're very easy to deal with as long as you do them the right way so if you don't have anything to stop them from flying off then I guarantee you they're going to fly off so you can see that the yoke um, is pretty conventional and it just uh, pivots on a standard pivot. There's really nothing too remarkable here at all. It does have a funny spring there though to keep tension on the yoke. Yeah, that's the intermediate wheel coming off there. So these movements, um, if if you don't already know, they tick at uh, thirty six thousand beats per hour. Which is uh, except is exceptionally high. So that means they beat ten times per second. And yes, I did work that out by calculator just to make sure that I didn't make a mistake. I already knew that, but I just wanted to double double check it. So I've just moved over onto the train side now, and um, you'll see the top plate of the movement there, and also the balance. They didn't do any really high grade finishing on these movements, however, they do. They are very nicely finished, um, but they don't have any um, any perlage or anything like that on them. Now I'm not wearing any wearing any finger cots or anything here because I'm disassembling the movements so all of these parts will be going into clean, into the cleaning machine anyway. <clears throat> so I'm just taking off the balance now because that's the number one thing that you can make a mess of and um, I don't really want to mess up the balance because I suspect it will be very difficult to get another one. So that's the two screws on the balance cock, and the balance cock's uh, a bit of an oddball one because it's a two screw style one. Uh, most watches only have one screw on the balance, balance cock, but usually higher end movements, um, you know, like Rolex has two screws on their balance cocks, um, will have a two screw balance cock. So that's the bottom of the balance there. You can uh, see the adjustment system there, it's got some extra bits and pieces on it, but otherwise it's fairly conventional. 
and you can see the pallet cock there and also the pallet well the end of the pallet fork now what I'm going to do is just take the tension off the mainspring this is this is pretty tricky um, in most cases to do you have to be very careful when doing it because if it lets go you could easily damage one of the wheels in the movement <clears throat> Now I'm just taking off that screw. So Seiko chose not to uh, jewel the barrel arbors on this movement, but uh, I don't know that it really needs it. It didn't really have any significant wear on it on the barrel arbor uh, ports. Some of their higher end, higher, uh, high end movements they do, but not on this one. So we've got there. We've removed the ratchet wheel. And we're just going to move, remove the winding wheel now. So it's pretty conventional. It's uh, two screws and a plate. And of course, I had some difficulty just getting those lined up uh, in between myself and the camera. Just trying to be as careful as possible so I don't scratch anything. And one of them just fell off there. So another interesting point to note with this movement is that it has an unconventional um, drivetrain, which we'll see. But basically the second hand is driven indirectly, which is not uncommon. However, the way it transfers the power to the second hand is uncommon. And uh, we'll see that shortly. There's really nothing bizarre here with the uh, with the way it winds up. I'm just going to remove that with Rodico because I was, was a little bit fiddly to do it with the tweezers. An in interesting thing to note with these higher end movements, they all have a serial number. So um, nobody really knows if there's some sort of database with these serial numbers. I suspect there probably isn't, but um, yeah, who really knows? You'll see the serial number there is, uh, I think, 311922 or something like that. Was it six four four? I can't really tell from here. Okay, so we're just taking off the winding bridge there. And you can just see the tip of the very complex um, stop second lever. It's actually made up of three parts, which is unusual. And you can see the top of the barrel. <clears throat> there's nothing really unusual about the barrel on the uh, 44 they jeweled the um, top and the bottom of the barrel rather than the um, the barrel or the plates where the barrel label goes into sorry about that that's just an email coming in um, so yeah, that is a bit unusual on the 44, but they have uh, chosen not to do it with the 45. And I'm um, just taking off the plate there.
just trying to be very careful when I take these off because I don't want to break any pivots. Of course, there's a die fix setting in there as well. So instead of trying to tackle it with tweezers, I think um, here I'm going to lever it up. I did this a few weeks ago, so I don't remember. Yep, so there's a little space under there just to gently lever the, um, the plate up, which means that we're not going to gouge it with tweezers. There we go. So you can see the, the gear train there. So you see at the very top is the fourth wheel. The uh, it might be easier just to say this as I, as I remove them. So there's the stop second lever, but the pins just sort of come out of place, so yeah, I can't really show you it operating. I do have another video of that operating anyway. And I'm just going to remove that now because it'll get in the way. There we go. And I think I'm going to remove the barrel here. Oh, I'm actually showing how it transmits. So the barrel turns a um, an intermediate wheel, which then turns what they call a large driving wheel. And the large driving wheel uh, drives the um, the fourth wheel and also the rest of the train which is a bit unusual that's the large driving wheel that I'm taking off there now I took off the fourth wheel earlier so yeah most watch drive trains don't have anywhere near this many gears and you'll see there the, uh, the intermediate wheel down the bottom there Actually, I'll make a correction on that. The uh, the intermediate wheel, um, the fourth wheel's uh, driven. Uh, actually, I'm just yeah. The uh, the fourth wheel is driven by the um, by the escape wheel. And one one of the um, symptoms of um, indirect drive on your watch movement is that you'll get a stuttering second hand and these definitely do stutter so on a lot of Swiss watches that are driven like this they do have a spring um, which allows you to adjust the tension on whichever wheel is driving the second hand so that you can uh, basically tune out the stutter but uh, this movement doesn't have that so there's pretty much no way of reducing stutter Also, the very long second hand uh, really exacerbates the stutter. So I'm just removing the pallet cock there. And it's a little bit fiddly to remove from memory. And we want to be careful because uh, we don't want to break the pivot that is on top of the pallet fork they're uh, incredibly small. You can see that the escape wheel's got a lot of teeth on it so that is the part that um, regulates how often the watch ticks so for 10 ticks per second you need a lot of teeth and there we go Okay, so now I'm just going to remove the centre bridge, which has, you'll see there, the um, there's a little uh, intermediate wheel, which is driven by a uh, an oddball centre wheel, which is driven by the barrel. Again, this was a bit fiddly. So 
but eventually I got it. <clears throat> and up that comes. So that center wheel also acts as the cannon pinion. I'll remove the bridge there and you can see that intermediate wheel. They always get very dirty, those intermediate wheels in this watch. Not quite sure why. And the combined center wheel and cannon pinion. Alright, that's pretty much the end of this video. If I need to make any corrections, I'll make them in the comments or in the description. And uh, yeah, keep a lookout for another video later on where I'll show the watch running. Thanks.